All right, I'm gonna get all my stuff. I got all my, got my, my bubbly water for my burps. Hold on, everybody. Tasha's got a butt chug a beer real quick. <laughs> I just like stabbed the side of a. I've got kombucha in my SVU pod, especially heinous best friendship mug laughing cup. Yeah. Mm. I'm so pumped that people are getting theirs. Elite squad people are getting theirs and um, posting them. Yeah. I want to I wanna give them more stuff. I know, me too. <laughs> <laughs> We're never going to make any money. I know. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Welcome to SVU Pod, especially heinous. I'm Gabe. I'm Tasha. We are on season three, episode 11, Monogamy. 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 Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> it's that's the only joy that's the only joy that's coming now okay i want to hit this before we get into this terrible awful controversial you know what it is it's just controversially exhausting Mm -hmm. it didn't hit me the same way the one a couple episodes with glenn and the and Mm -hmm. the foster family and all that stuff did but after that episode we got some feedback from listeners that were like you guys take care of your mental health And if it's too hard, don't do it. It's funny that you would mention that because there was a child abuse, molestation, sexual assault episode. And I did the chaser on Jason Vukovic, who is in prison for... Vigilante. Yeah, yeah. The Avenging Angel. That was a really tough episode for me. And I wasn't even going to do a chaser because I'm like, I can't read about this shit. I can't do this, da, da, da. And Gabe's like, whatever you need. I know this shit's fucked up for you. Just don't do it then. And I was talking to my therapist about it. And I was like, Gabe is so supportive because, you know, she said this or whatever. And my therapist was like, that's kind of enabling enabling mm-hmm. in regards to your like OCD and giving yourself like letting those intrusive thoughts be in charge mm-hmm. and like the stuff because it's like, OK, th- I'm reading about child abuse, so I'm applying it to my own kids. Mm-hmm. It's a thing that exists in the world. And this is like a choice that I'm making. And if I avoid it, then it gets like bigger for me. Right. Also, like sometimes it's like we need to remember it's a TV show and like this stuff does happen in real life, but it's a TV show. Yeah. We get um like viscerally angry at yeah. people playing people. Right. We're kind of like balls deep in each episode, but it's like, yeah, I thought you were going to say each other. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's a fucking TV show. Thank you so much for giving a shit about our mental health. But, like, we have a a, a therapist on retainer. <laughs> no, we, like, both have our individual therapists who we talk to about this shit because I do let it stick in my craw. And it's, I've talked yeah. about it with my therapist. She encourages me to, like, continue and not skip them. Because why am I skipping them? Because I don't, I want to pretend like it doesn't exist. That's why. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to look at extremely graphic pictures. I'm not going to give descriptions that I feel like aren't necessary for the story just for like, I don't like the shock stuff. Yeah. But yeah, I have to like get myself through like talking about it and whatever. Anyway, that this, said. This podcast is part of Tasha's therapy. It is. This is like exposure therapy for me. Like parts of it legit are. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is about me. Thanks for being here for my journey, everyone. <laughs> I'm surprised you haven't mentioned my ginormous fucking leopard scarf. Oh, that entire jungle cat that's wrapped around (laughs) your body. I killed it myself. Let's get going. Let's do this. All right. So we open on a couple fighting in a parking garage about how much parking costs. They're getting their car. They're at the window. Everyone in the first 10 minutes of this episode are like trying to outdo the other one's New York accent. <laughs> I it know. Sounds like. The woman's like, the sign said it was more to park an SUV. Yeah. And the dude's like, 45 bucks. That's an entire dinner at Fort Lee, including parking. Yeah. I'm like, what? He's like, I hope you had a good time. And she's like, well, you didn't. <laughs> like, what and then the valet doing. fucking heals up with the car. The lady tries to get into her side of the SUV and she's like, oh, it's all wet. (laughs) And the dude, this dude was such a douche, by the way. The valet gets out of the car and the guy gives him like a stiff $1 bill. Yeah. Like it's a big fucking here you go. Yeah. And He's like, so oh, I just had it wash and then snatches it back. The lady comes around to the front of the car and puts her hands in front of the headlight. Like, what's all over me? It's blood. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. It's SVU. It's, it's blood. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess I shouldn't say that. It could have been jizz. 
<laughs> Stabler shows up to the scene and Benson's already there. They were called because the parking attendant found a woman. Oh my God. Found a woman named Nicole Manning in the parking garage. She was naked from the waist down. And this beat cop tells Stabler it wasn't a robbery because her money is still in her wallet. And Nicole's being wheeled into an ambulance. She's in and out of consciousness because her head was all bashed around and Benson's like, I'm going to ride along. So she hops into the ambulance with Nicole. That's where all the blood came from, by the way. It's it's Nicole's blood yeah. on the crabby people's car. I wonder if that made them like rethink like what was important. I don't know. They're yeah, because like, oh you my God. don't talk to him again. They're like, oh my God, I love you so much. Oh, oh my, my God, God, I'm so glad. Oh, I hope everybody's okay. Hold me, Tony. <laughs> Tony, please hold me. So far, all the extras that are in this, I fucking love. Every single one. The parking mm-hmm. garage guys, the paramedics, they're fucking adorable. They're all super cute. I wanted more. I hope they all have an apartment together. <laughs> <laughs> the beat cop tells Stabler that the blood where she was found looks like Nicole was attacked just minutes before they found her. Stabler asked the cop how many stab wounds she had because it's like she's profusely bleeding. How many stab wounds does she have? The cop goes, she wasn't stabbed. Boom. Cut to inside the ambulance. We're all like, what? And Nicole starts having a seizure. Turns out Nicole has a huge cut on her stomach and one of the adorable paramedics. He's like on the radio telling them what's up and he's like, Oh, it's a huge cut in his stomach. It looks like she's got an emergency C-section to me. Benson's like, oh my God, she was pregnant? Nicole flatlines. They start CPR. Mm-hmm. Cut back to the parking garage. The cop tells Stabler that there's no sign of the fetus yet. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. So immediately I'm like, oh my God, somebody came and cut the baby out and s- stole it. Stabler is a dad. Yeah. So first and foremost, he's a father. And a husband. He's a dad. He's a husband. Thirdly, he's a cop. Somewhere in there, he's a man (laughs) with needs. But that's not where we're at. Where we're at is we're in dad country right now. All right, so now we're at the hospital. The doctor tells Benson that besides the stomach wound, Nicole has a bunch of head trauma, and it looked like she'd been kicked in her stomach. They had done a rape kit and found fluids. This doctor doesn't think Nicole's chances are that great. She's got all kinds of shit going on. She's not getting a whole lot of oxygen to her brain. And then the doctor thinks that it's possible the fetus was kidnapped because it was developed enough to survive outside the womb. But not for long. Because Benson was like, oh my god, you think he took the baby? She's Mm -hmm. assuming that it's just dead. Right. Yeah. But it was viable. Like, it was a viable... It was like 28 weeks or something like that. Or it said that... This is... Don't, like, send an angry email yet. Like, this is all stuff that we're going to get to. Yeah. The doctor is basically just like, yeah, the baby maybe is dead, but just so you know, there's another option. I'm a doctor and it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're in the parking garage. The super adorable parking garage attendant guy is feeling bad that Nicole was alone and he didn't go with her. He's like, this is a good neighborhood. I didn't even think about it. But Mm -hmm. he didn't hear or see anything. He didn't hear anybody scream or anything. Usually he's the only person up there that time of night. He didn't see anyone leave, but he tells Stabler that there's another way down from the second floor that leads to the back alley. Now we're at the hospital again craig shows up asking benson to catch him up and craig like i've got every fucking available cop out looking around the neighborhood just everywhere mm-hmm. and then oh my fucking god you see john fucking ritter he's the husband yes, okay and is. i was like yes i love john ritter rest in peace benson thinks that whoever did this it's obviously like super personal and that they shouldn't rule out the husband obviously duh my side note on this was my money is on sweet, precious American sweetheart, John Ritter. Mm-hmm. Also because we know that already, because this is a pretty famous episode. But. Yeah, but it's also like, you see fucking Three's Company, fucking problem child, dad, John oh. Ritter in an episode, and he's you think he's just going to be like a side character? No fucking way. Like, we all know no. he did this. Mm-hmm. I love that he is such an IRL lovable person, because then I was able to watch his acting as opposed to be like, I fucking hate this guy because no it's john ritter you can't it's like yeah. oh look at john ritter playing this part like so good i know <laughs> so good at it he's versatile he can do anything mm. okay so now they're in a waiting room the husband says that he and nicole were supposed to meet at dinner at seven and he was at the restaurant but she was always late so he wasn't worried right away he's a psychiatrist so before going to the restaurant he was in session with a patient a fucking nurse i don't know if you saw this tasha but i um, did only <laughs> because of your note with it though <laughs> There's a nurse slowly wheeling this machine behind them and the camera follows her until it pans over to Benson. It was like just the weirdest transition. Yeah, it was so weird. And this lady was just like slowly pushing this cart. It was (laughs) fucking bananas. 
She breaks in a song. This is my moment. <laughs> I am an actress. Benson asks him if he and Nicole had had sex in the last 24 hours. He's like, no. Benson tells him that they think maybe Nicole had been raped when she was attacked. She asks him for a blood sample. He looks confused, but agrees to whatever they need and kind of like looks away and scoffs like he can't, can't believe they'd think it was him. So then he says he tried calling Nicole, but after an hour, he just went home because he was sitting there waiting at the restaurant. She didn't show. He's like, I'm going to go. He doesn't know anyone who would want to hurt her. And he says, Nicole was a good person. I mean, is. The doctor said she might recover. And Benny and Craig's kind of shoot each other this side eye Uh that I felt had the same energy as the meme that you posted on the Facebook group of that Renaissance painting with the (laughs) caption, gently touching your friend's hand because you've spotted someone acting like an asshole and you want to talk about it later. Yeah, That's the side eye that they gave each other. (laughs) Yeah, it was definitely like, um, yeah. It wasn't like a cartoony, like, (laughs) what? It was like a, you heard that too, right, girl? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Shh, 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 shh. It's like, you know me, I know you, we know each other's eyes. That's fucked up. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Back in the parking garage, Boston Rob Lab dude is telling Munch and Toots that they found a ton of prints on Nicole's car. Our dude is swaggery outside of a lab coat and in a windbreaker. Mm-hmm. This guy has got a whole nother level of confidence in that fucking forensics He's windbreaker. Just swishing by, doing all the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> So check it out, guys. Like one arm is fully dangling behind his back. He's that swaggy. He's like lab tech Mr. Rogers when he changes jackets. (laughs) Yeah. I'm starting to Um, become attracted to him a little bit. Oh my God, me too. Really? Yes. (laughs) Good. (laughs) He just like knows a lot, but he still seems down to earth. You know? Yeah. (laughs) He's got good hair too. He does. So I'm attracted to a lot of people this episode. I am just going to say, we're going to jump on it right now. And I do kind of feel, I, there's some episodes where I'm like, God, you cougary bitches, like (laughs) chill the fuck out. And then there's times where I'm like, oh, are we objectifying men? And then I'm kind of like, fuck men. So (laughs) Yeah, fuck them. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway. All of them. I want to fuck all of them. I mean... (laughs) So he he's like, we got to rule out the parking garage staff, friends and family, etc. It's going to be hard, though, because there's a ton of valets in the city. Also, the car was for sale. So grandos were touching it while test driving it. Mm-hmm. A lot of circumstances make this a lot harder than it needed to be. Boston Rob says there's a ton of blood and he's not sure yet if it's just Nicole's or the babies as well. No placenta or cord. That was all taken. Stabler finds a ton of bloody antibacterial hand wipes around the back exit because nobody else thought to look there. Thank God he showed up. Mm -hmm. Stabler also wonders if the fetus was the reason for the attack. He's like, I don't think the perp wanted Nicole to die, but maybe suffer. And that's interesting to me because I would just assume that it was a black market adoption situation. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I just have to do this quickly, get this baby out and take off. Right. But I guess it wouldn't make as much sense for them to go after a woman who's not to term. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Back at the precinct, we've got Benny Stabes and Daddy Cragen. Dan Florick is such a fucking gem of an actor here. Mm-hmm. The scene starts zoomed in on him tying his shoe. Like he had stopped their walk and talk to tie his shoe. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I bet Dan Florick thought of that. We got to break up these walk and talks a little bit. <laughs> Keep talking. I got to tie my shoe. <laughs> I love it. Benson tells Cragen that Nicole's husband was at the restaurant and his cell phone records show that as well. The rape kit rules out the husband as the rapist too. So they're like, well, put that on the back burner. Mm. Hmm. Toots gets a call that a set of prints inside and out of the car belong to a dude named Kyle Novacek. Kyle has done time for assault three and possession of heroin. Apparently, apparently, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Apparently, you usually don't see those kinds of charges for a heroin user unless they're dosed with PCP or something. Nicole is an RN at a methadone clinic, so that might be the connection between Kyle and Nicole. Then fucking dumbass cunt Marine walks into the precinct. <laughs> she must have gotten lost on her way to the deli where she works as a sandwich maker. <laughs> She's probably won awards for her sandwich building skills, idiot. <laughs> She's a sandwich artist at Subway. <laughs> Best of the tri-state area. Maureen seems nervous and wants to talk to Stabler, so they kind of pop into Cragen's office to talk privately. Benny tells Cragen so far, no Oh my God, host- the trophy is a bronze tomato. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Too late. It's been 30 years coming. 
Um, <laughs> Benson tells Craig in so far, no hospitals have had any premature babies come in. There's been no hits at any of the airports or bus terminals, and nothing came up with the neighborhood canvassing. Craig wants to widen the search, and Benny wants to talk to Kyle Novacek. Staves and Marine come out of Craig's office. Benson's doing small talk shit with Maureen about school and college applications and blah, blah, blah. Maureen takes off and Benny asks Stabler if everything's good. And he's like, yeah. But like, she doesn't believe him and neither do I. Yeah. Because she's like, oh, Maureen, what's up with this? And da, da, da. And Stabes is like, you should probably take off, huh? Bye. Yeah. Also, I didn't even realize this until right now. But at the beginning of the episode, when he came to the parking garage and she was already there, she was like, wow, that was a fast drive from Queens. And he's like, I stayed in the city tonight. <gasps> That's right. So this some... is the beginning. This is the beginning. This is the beginning of mm-hmm. a thread that we all are familiar with that I didn't realize until you said that. Mm-hmm. Also, thank God, because we haven't seen anything about Stabler's fucking personal life for a few episodes. Okay, everybody, let's go to the construction site, okay? Yeah. Get follow, on the bus. Follow us. Come on. Single file. Here's your snack pack. Hold each other's hand. Where's your buddy? <laughs> Munch and Toots are at this construction site. They're asking around for Kyle Novacek. Mm-hmm. Boom. Here he comes. Hi, Kyle. I fucking love this dude. Is this he? Is Bo- Sorry, go ahead. It's Bobby Cannavale. What were you going to say? Is he what? Was he in that episode where he got shot in the dick? What? By the guy that had the... Um, You're going to have to specify which shot in the dick episode. The, the, the schizophrenic guy. What is it? Experiencing schizophrenia? How, what the, is guy, it? Uh, the, the guy with schizophrenia. Yeah, he ended up like they gave him some medic- a cocktail medication to make him become aware, and he was eating like the prison oh, thing. Oh, that's oh no, guy? that's no. not him. No, that's okay. not him. That's okay. not him. It was that was a Bobby Cannavale type. Yeah, but no, no, <laughs> he wishes. Sorry, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> He's probably dead. So. He- <laughs> <laughs> Stop. So Bobby Cannavale's most recent thing that we've seen him in is Nine Perfect Strangers. He was in Blue Jasmine, Ant-Man. He does some voices on Big Mouth and BoJack Horseman. P.S. Are you up to date on Big Mouth yet? Because a new season just came out. Season five. I'm done. I haven't watched it yet. It's great. Okay. He had a huge reoccurring role on Will and Grace. He played a doctor on Nurse Jackie. He was on Boardwalk Empire, Cold Case, Six Feet Under, tons of stuff. Mm -hmm. He's crazy recognizable. Mm -hmm. I also find him a very attractive. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, Gabe, some trees are made for climbing, you know? (laughs) It's agreed. (laughs) He's, yeah, I, I just do. I just do. I don't know. I think part of it's the accent, and he seems, like, mad all the time. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> so, I'm into that. <laughs> Let's go back to his character. In this, he's Kyle Novacek. He says he's working, and he's clean, so he doesn't fuck around with that old life. These guys mm-hmm. are hard questioning him. Yeah. He says last night, he was in a class that he takes. It starts at 7 And he works until six. So he has just enough time to go from work to class. Mm -hmm. He also doesn't drive because his car took a shit. He's looking for a new car. He test drove Nicole's car last week. And he's like, what's this all about? It seems like he's got perfectly reasonable explanation for where he was at, why he would be connected, etc. Toots grabs Kyle and gets in his face. He's like, where's the fucking baby Mm -hmm. and this dude had no idea what was going on he's like what somebody hurt her baby so the detectives want him to take a dna test and he's like uh no if you guys had anything on me i'd be in the back of your squad car already then i was like oh my god this guy bone nicole and he is the father literally all of us know john Ritter did it okay he's yeah. far too famous to just be like a side guy right um now we're in the methadone clinic benson and stabler are talking to this lady who was just like dudes you know i can't give out patient information this shit is confidential and stabler's right. like oh you want to see the crime scene photos of nicole like that fucking matters like the law is the law mm-hmm. N- names need protection for a reason she really wants to help out but she can't they ask right. is there anybody that's like harassing you guys and she's like on a daily basis like we're in a fucking methadone clinic right but nothing thing like super violent benson asks if any neighborhood people come in there being assholes i'm sure this place attracts some real winners and i was like wow Mm-mm. uh Mm-mm. geez god forbid people try and get fucking help olivia the lady says that the only real problem they've ever had is with this other nurse named aaron cena nicole found out aaron was stealing methadone for herself aaron was arrested lost her job and nursing license mm, that's a motive to me mm-hmm. that's right detective joiner that is a motive <laughs> 
So now we're at Aaron Cena's house. This is actor Marianne Hagen. She comes mm. back in 2005 as Mrs. Sellers in the episode Pure. Mm. So let's keep a lookout. She's pretty rough looking because she's playing an addict, but she's a gorgeous woman. She is. She's a good actress, too. Mm-hmm. Her apartment is fucking dirty and gross, and she's fucking smoking a cig. Inside. Yeah, that's so gross. Inside smoking you. is so gross. I do it sometimes. You do? It, Sometimes Inside I, smoking is so gross, even when I do it. I, it is gross, but sometimes I just want to do something fucking, like, naughty, and you know? Yeah. Like, let me have well, it. Well, you know, I'd rather you do it here. So. <laughs> <laughs> so Benson's like, hey, nice place. And Aaron's like, yeah, I cleaned it up especially for you. Ha! <laughs> That's in my note. <laughs> and then fucking Stabler says, your boyfriend doesn't mind the mess? What? Fuck off. She says, who says I have a boyfriend? And Saber's like, come on, a girl like you, I'm sure you have a few. What the actual fuck is he doing? So she responds by saying, you coming on to me? Your friend can watch. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty funny. And <laughs> he's like, he's she, like, no. She was, uh, she didn't give any fucks. She gave zero. He's like, just fucking shut up and sit down. Stabler tells Aaron his theory that Aaron and her boyfriend follow Nicole into a parking garage, get into a fight that gets out of hand. And he keeps saying boyfriend. And she's like, no, I don't have a boyfriend. Benson opens a door to her room and Aaron gets fucking pissed. Mm -hmm. It's a little kid's room. There's like presents everywhere. And Aaron's like, you guys got to fucking get out of here. So she has a son, but social services took him away. So Benson and Sailor tell Aaron, they're like, you must be fucking jealous of Nicole. The woman who took everything from you is now going to have her own baby. So she's like, get out. And then Stabler like weirdly grabs her wrist and he's like, are you fucking using? Oh, it looks like you are. Benson's like, we can help you. And Aaron's like, no, you can't. Nicole pissed off the wrong fucking person and look what happened to her. Well, who did she piss off? Aaron says that the only thing she knows is that Nicole asked for it and got what she deserved and she had nothing to do with it. And to get the fuck out. Benson and Stabler are in the hallway of Aaron's apartment and they're like, something really fucking scared Aaron. So they need to get back in there and look for signs of Nicole's fetus. Staves gets a phone call. He answers it, and then he was like, we're on it. It was the appropriate amount of time. Yeah. Where somebody was like, hey, we got this thing. You got to come down here. Here's the address. And he was like, oh, we're, we're, we'll be there in a minute. They actually were walking, and they stopped. And Olivia was like looking at him while he answered the phone, like waiting. Instead of being like, bring, bring up. <laughs> <laughs> it, it rings, and he just fucking chucks it down the hall. And he's like, we'll be there. <laughs> Okay, so Benson and Stabler show up at this alley, right? This is where they got the call to. Mm -hmm. They walk up on Craig and sending two cops to take a dude experiencing homelessness to get some food and go to a shelter. Craig just looks at them when they walk up and says, dumpster. Mm -hmm. Immediately, I'm like, fuck. Mm -hmm. Corner Warner comes up a flight of stairs holding what we all assume is the wrapped up body of Nicole's baby. Mm. Corner Warner says that the rate of decomp fits the time frame and... As she walks away, Stabler, who we know is going to be affected by this Mm. harder than anyone, Stabler goes, what was it? And she turns around and says, it was a little boy. Mm -hmm. (sighs) At the hospital, Benson and Stabler are informing Nicole's husband about the baby's death. John Ritter's like, well, I want to get everything in order before Nicole wakes up. And Benson's like, dude, you don't have to do anything right now. The Emmy needs to investigate more. So just chill out. It's fine. Relax. But then I'm like, why is Um, he rushing? But see, and then I'm like, that would be nice if I woke up and it was all taken care of. There's nothing I can do and it was Mm -hmm. all done and we don't have, like, you're already processing it before I'm even fucking conscious. Right. That's true. So Stabler wants to ask him about Aaron Cena. He said, I remember the name because Aaron tried to get Nicole to testify on her behalf at some hearing for her son's custody. And Nicole was like, what? That's bananas. Of course, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. In response to Nicole being like, no, Aaron yelled on their answering machine a few times. That's so weird for like Aaron to ask Nicole to after. After she was the reason she got fired. I mean, she wasn't the reason. Her stealing methadone was the reason. Yeah. Yeah. But But her. It's like, why would you even ask her? Why would you ask Nicole to testify on your behalf? So then the husband, John Ritter, was like, girl, we should call the cops. Okay? This is scary for us. Mm -hmm. And Nicole's like, no. She didn't think it was necessary. Which seems like a diversion from John Ritter at this point. Hmm. To me. (laughs) So then Benson asks him how Nicole's doing. And he says that they had to do a hysterectomy. And he doesn't know how he's going to tell her. Because not only did she lose this pregnancy, but she'll never be able to get pregnant again. Yeah. So now we're in the Emmy office. Corner Warner is telling Munch and Toots, nope, you have to do this part. Sorry. Okay. 
So now we're at the ME office. Coroner Warner is telling Munch and Toots that the fetus died of blows to the head, which is fucking awful. Toots says that the perp kicked Nicole and was wondering if the head trauma could be from that. And Coroner Warner's like, well, there's really no way to tell. And Toots asked how long the baby lived, but she's still trying to determine that. Yeah. Which comes into play later. Mm -hmm. You guys, I feel like this episode of our podcast so far is not funny. And... (laughs) I have like a weird feeling like I should apologize for it. But then at the same time, I'm like, man, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to We're get making any- some pretty solid jokes about dicks earlier. It's fine. <laughs> oh, that's true. Boop, yeah. boop, 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 dicks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a dick break every once in a while. <laughs> Isn't that what my whole life is? I got mine right here. <gasps> <laughs> All right, so now we're at the precinct. Pregnant tells the gang that Kyle Novacek's alibi cleared him. That leaves Aaron Cena as the prime suspect unless they can find the dude who helped her. The only way they can get to her is by getting her in for a drug test. The judge had ruled her parole. Random drug testing is fine. So if they get her and she is high, which they think she is because she was at her house, yeah, they can use that as leverage for her to talk. Right, right. Yeah, sobriety is a condition of her parole. Yeah. They're not sure where she is, but Toot says that any heroin addict will keep their methadone clinic appointment. And she is a patient of the clinic where she used to work with Nicole. So now we're doing a fucking stakeout. Benson Stabler in the car, staking out the clinic. (laughs) I wrote that weird. Benson's like, she'll be here. I don't know. Maybe she won't. Stabler's like, well, you can leave if you want. She's like, maybe you can stop being a fucking jerk and tell me what's going on. Nobody wants to tiptoe around your fucking emotions all the time, Stabler. Ugh. So she asked him if it's about Marine, and he's like, ah, I've just been distracted, and I didn't send a check to Columbia for Marine. And Benson's not having that. And she's yeah. like, Elliot, what is this? Uh huh. And then they see Aaron walk up, and they're like, oh shit. So they jump out and arrest her, and she begs them to let her in the clinic. So we're in the questioning room now. Stabler walks in and tells Aaron she tested positive for heroin. She doesn't give a shit and really wants to get it. She's like, yeah, what? So I'm a heroin addict. Also, her face is beat up. Mm-hmm. She asked Stabler for a soda, and he's like, no, not until you tell us who you're hiding from. She won't tell him. Benson tells her she's going down for everything then. He's like, if you're not going to say shit, if this is all on you. Everything points to you. Aaron's super pissed and says she had nothing to do with Nicole and what happened to the fetus. Benson says, Nicole had everything you wanted, and you made her pay for it. So then she finally, quiver lip, gives up Kyle Novacek. That's who she's afraid of. Stabler's like, Kyle's your boyfriend? And she's like, no, he's Nicole's boyfriend. Ooh. Oh, shit. So that's why he was, like, upset about the possibility of somebody hurting Nicole's fetus. Remember when they were questioning? He's like, somebody hurt the baby or whatever? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now we're at Kyle's apartment. Munch knocks on the door and rushes in once Kyle opens it, which I don't think is legal, but whatever. Munch and Toots start cuffing him, and he says he'll tell the truth. I think truth. it is if they have a warrant for arrest. Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah, because they can, like, just break down doors and shit yeah, with they their can butts. Do or fucking or spin move, <laughs> fucking booty bounce <laughs> kicks up down the door oh Stabler just like maybe he's out walking the dog (laughs) Stabler just like pops his ass on the door once and the whole apartment explodes (laughs) (laughs) yeah so they start cuffing him and he's like oh my god I'll tell the truth and a bunch of truths like we don't give a shit now they just want to take him in to get DNA and Kyle's like the DNA will come back positive because fucking me and Nicole made love that afternoon I fucking hate that term made love by the way what Um, do you want him to call it anything else it's to me it's kind of like the you exclusively say boned so <laughs> um it's kind of like the whole how like the wiener thing it's like there's no real good way to say like i'm not gonna be like oh put your penis in my mouth oh, put your cut in my. it's like <laughs> put your wiener it's like oh we made love like, like oh we fucked i like i like how uh you're like oh put your cat oh play like that doesn't sound like you're like wiener is the best option <laughs> i know it's just yeah. there's no good option but i don't know why that's the better one so anyway he's porked because like, <laughs> cause me and nicole porked that afternoon okay you guys <laughs> we fucking porked okay so <laughs> we pork and beaned all afternoon <laughs> Fork and beans. They accuse him of raping Nicole. And uh we stove stop stuffing the whole day through. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> they accuse they accuse him of raping Nicole and taking the fetus and beating up Aaron. Kyle's like, I knew you guys would think I was guilty, but that baby is mine. 
Why would I do that to my own child? And they're like, oh. and it's like, um, the same reason a lot of fucking yeah. awful people would do something like that. But yeah, this is SVU, bro. We're at the precinct. The gang's doing a little walk and talk. So CSU's at Kyle's looking for the weapon and they're waiting on the DNA results and a paternity test. Stabler thinks Kyle did this maybe because Nicole wouldn't leave her husband. And Munch says that maybe Nicole's husband did it. Kyle did say that Nicole's husband was probably catching on. Hmm. Interesting. Because when they talked to Nicole's husband, husband he didn't mention that at all at all he either knew or didn't want them to know Craigan sends benson and stabler to the hospital to talk to nicole she just woke up at the hospital nicole tells benson and stabler that she didn't see who did it she got hit in the head from behind and woke up in the hospital and then was told about the baby how fucking traumatic stabler asks her about kyle and she's like i've been seeing him almost a year and had seen him earlier that afternoon before i was attacked and she doesn't think that it would have been him who would have attacked her he wanted to get married and she did too but when she found out she was pregnant she said everything changed she had to make choices based on what's safest not what made her happy Mm -hmm. she had told the husband that she was leaving him and that the baby wasn't his i didn't know why she would do that if she thought it was safest to stay with him like i feel like that was like a writing thing yeah that didn't make sense to me either and it doesn't she said this about her husband she goes i thought he'd be angry but at the time he was really calm there Mm -hmm. is no scarier reaction to Mm me than that yeah please snap at me if you're mad like if you were like quietly like "Mm -hmm. no I'm going to talk about it later. I would be like, I'm getting murdered. (laughs) Yeah. But to be frank, like, that's my response to a lot of things. Yeah. So now is when we learn her husband's name. Richard. (laughs) Richard had told the detectives that he and Nicole were meeting at 7, but Nicole said that she was meeting him at 7.30. And she goes, did Richard tell you 7? (laughs) Richard. (laughs) Richard, you dick. You fucking dick. (laughs) Now we're back at the precinct. (laughs) Gang's all here, including Huang. Cabot asks why the husband wasn't a suspect to begin with, because she's smart. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Alex. So Richard is a psychiatrist, and Munch is like, he's a shrink, so he knows how to mess with your head. Not you. And points at Huang. And Huang's like, no, you're exactly right. (laughs) I have a black belt in head fuckery, everybody. I could make you all lose a week of sleep for fun. He's so chill. It like toggles back and forth for me between being interesting, hot, and scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all of those things together. (laughs) No better pork sandwich. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Throw some barbecue sauce on that pork sandwich. (laughs) Okay. The barbecue sauce is jizz. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So Huang says that shrinks go through four years of medical school and a one-year medical internship so benson's like dude he could probably do a shitty c-section if he needed to Mm -hmm. the bartender remembers seeing richard at the restaurant but doesn't remember him leaving richard said he made two phone calls to nicole at around 10 to 8 while he was still at the restaurant they're timelining this shit now Mm -hmm. they need to contact the cell phone provider to get more info on where Richard was when he made the calls. Duh. Mm -hmm. It's hard to think that he'd be able to go to the restaurant, run across town to attack Nicole, then come all the way back in like 45 minutes. Richard's neighbor said they saw him get home around 830. Nicole doesn't get to the garage until 720 because she was supposed to meet Richard at 730. Mm hmm. Huang says that it's not uncommon, then rambles on about being cuckolded and females of species looking for mates with the most desirable traits, Mm -hmm. and that actually most species are not naturally monogamous. Yeah, I 150% agree with that. Everybody knows that. I mean, it's... There's only one mammal. There's only one mammal, I think, that is... can choose to be monogamous or not, and it's like this shrew, this tiny little... this tiny little, like, varmint thing. No, because what about, like... Aren't orc don't orcas do that? And like dolphins? No. What about <laughs> just start asking about animals? What about woodpeckers? What about penguins? They're not mammals. Are penguins mammals? No, they're birds. No, because they lay eggs. What about us? Okay. <laughs> In response to Huang being like, wow, well, most species aren't naturally monogamous. Munch is like, well, that explains my whole marital history. <laughs> but, um, psst, zing, uh, and Stabler's like, hey, quit 
the jokes. There's a dead baby involved. He's not wrong. Yeah. I mean, even though he should tell Munch to shut up more because a lot of times his jokes are not well-timed. Yeah. And Benson's like, with her eyes, what the fuck, Stabes? Yeah, little side-eye action there. Toots wants to know why Richard didn't just kill Nicole. Huang says that in Richard's mind, the problem wasn't Nicole. It was the baby. Stabler's having a hard time with this and kind of takes off. Benson takes off after him and she's like, you know what? We're all on your side. We're not fucking mind readers. If you're not going to say what's going on, fine. But there's nothing we can do to help you. Mm -hmm. Which I'm kind of like, he wasn't asking for help, but okay. Yeah, but he's Um, taking it out on everybody. So it's like... I know. know. So then she's like, is there someone else? And I was like, whoa. I was sort of like, that wasn't the vibe I was getting, but she knows him better than I do. Right. So, right. I don't know. It was a really random. I wonder if she, she's the detective here, too. She knows him better. She's the detective. I'm going to leave that up to her. Maybe that was an appropriate response. But he's like, no, it would almost be easier if there was, but there's not. Mm-hmm. So he opens up a little bit. He says he's having a hard time with the job. Every case is more fucked up than the last. Oh, is he? Is he having a hard time with the job? Is he? Every episode. Go ahead. God, I just love him. (laughs) (laughs) He tells Benson, he's like, I don't talk about this at all with my wife. And she feels like I'm shutting her out. And Benson's like, well, you are. I know because you do that. That's a thing you do. Mm -hmm. If you keep this up, you're going to ruin the best thing you ever had. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I love their friendship. I know. I love the tough love, hard honesty shit. Yeah. And then I see a scene like this and I'm like, see, that's why they can never fuck you guys. That's why they can never pull up in those pork and panties (laughs) and make that a fish. They can't. (laughs) Gross. I'm not here for the Benny and Stabes pork and beans. I'm not. Kind of am, man. But they have to be fucking while they, they drive off a cliff because they can't exist after. Then it has to be over. Yeah. yeah. Everything. Now we're at Tri-State Atlantic Wireless. Some dude tells Benson Stabler that the GPS on Richard's cell phone wasn't being used, but they can try and find out what cell phone tower he was connected to. Richard was using the Lincoln Center cell phone site when he made the calls to his wife. That's close to where Nicole was attacked. The restaurant is on the Upper East Side. Oh, shit. Richard fucking did it. But we knew that. You know, we already knew that. Very, very lazy gasp. Mm Mm-hmm. Now we're at the precinct. Fucking Richard belongs to a gym near Lincoln Center, so he was there changing his fucking clothes. He fucking signed in at 8 p.m. And he didn't walk into the gym covered in blood. The receptionist said that she saw him wearing a long ass fucking coat and carrying a duffel bag. There is no evidence at the gym. Having less than a half an hour to get home, they want to check the cab companies. But Huang doesn't think he took a cab because Richard seems too meticulous and wouldn't risk having the cabbie be a witness. It's like, I don't need any more witnesses. And Huang has like fucking nailed this so far. Right. First of all, Benson is like, we need somebody to run across the park. Munch is like, me and Toots did. And she was like, oh, you guys ran? And he's like, um, <laughs> we walked. <laughs> But I was like, Jesus. <laughs> but he's like, oh, uh, actually, we walked the distance and still had a few minutes to spare. Mm-hmm. Bitch. <laughs> Craig is calling Cabot for a warrant and wants Wong on this because Richard is also a psychiatrist. So now we're at Richard's apartment. They're digging through it. Dick ain't there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Benson hasn't found anything. No duffel bag. No medical equipment. His closet is psychotically organized and his bathroom has a million personal hygiene products that are just his. And Benson goes, so do I, but that doesn't make me a murderer. I know we haven't mentioned Benson's hair in a minute, but it looks like she got some highlights recently. So it's looking great. And I do like how she, it, 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 there are a lot of products to maintain everything that she's working with. Yeah. Anyway, let's continue with this. Huang thinks that everything this guy does is for appearances. And Huang's like excitedly profiling oh my this God, dude. I love this. And he's so jazzed. He's, He starts talking like Jeff Goldblum for some reason to me. He's like, this is going to be the worst Jeff Goldblum impression ever. Everything about him is all about appearances. Yes. The working out, the gym equipment. (laughs) For some reason, he has feelings of being unattractive, unmanly. His advantage is that he's extremely intelligent. Yes, as evidence of his careful planning. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Ironically, he's probably a pretty gifted psychiatrist. Yeah, Yeah, he's like pumped. I love this. I love him. He is such an awesome actor and he just seems like he's he's just like effortless. Mm -hmm. Kwong also goes on to say that Richard's life is all about control and order. Benson points out that his wife's closet is a mess. Mm -hmm. And Huang says that when Nicole threatened to destroy the order that Richard had created, he went to extremes to get it back. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, Boston Rob Lab dude comes in. (laughs) Oh, 
we got a box of knives. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> He's taking all the knives from the kitchen to the lab, but doesn't have a lot of hope of finding anything. Huang doesn't think he brought anything back from the crime scene to the house. And then all of a sudden, Richard walks in. Yes. Yeah, this whole time I was like, where ha, where were you? Yeah, they clearly have a warrant. Yeah, it was just... And they didn't feel the need to let him know. Yeah. He walks in, he's pissed about them being there and how they're disturbing the order of his place. Benson hands him the warrant while Stabler shades him and says, oh boy, you're going to have to make so many new labels. <laughs> <laughs> Stabler notices... <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> Stabler notices Richard's keys. There's a keychain that says RM on it. Stabler, whoop, snatches his keys and goes, Ramon. And then you hear from the other room, yeah? Lumen all these for me, would you? So Boston Rob's name is Ramon. Boston Ramon springs into action with his sharper image pocket blue light and luminol kit. The keys fucking covered in blood. Yeah. Okay. The whole thing is, is it doesn't matter how much you wash them because the plastic like absorbs the blood. Yeah. The blood. Blood. Yeah. Israeli Palestinian conflict muffin. <laughs> Blood. God, that was such a good. Okay. Banana. <laughs> So now we're in the interrogation room and I just fucking know Stabler is going to throw some shit around and get all personal because he's a fucking dad. Mm. But Benson and Stabler introduce Wong to Richard and Richard, he's smiley (laughs) and it's unsettling. And he's like, oh, they brought you in to shrink the shrink, huh? And like Wong. This is this is where John Ritter is like, oh, the acting, the acting. (laughs) Huang is barely even sitting down and says, does that make you feel important? And I was just like, damn, all right. Yeah. Right out the gate. Richard's like, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. Me and Nicole were having problems, but we were working on solving them. And then Richard says that Nicole thought that the best solution to her, quote, problem was to be with the man who fathered her child. And Huang says, and that was the wrong solution. And Richard's like, yeah. And then Huang says, and now her problem doesn't exist because there is no child. And Richard says, well, yeah. And he's like kind of a beat and it's just really weird. Yeah. Benson tells Richard that Nicole just wanted to get away from him, which, okay, whatever. That goes back to that weird writing thing in the hospital. Um, and then Richard's like, Nicole doesn't know what she wants. Oof. Yeah. And then Huang was like, well, Nicole did seem to know what she wants because she was with another man. Uh-huh. And then Richard says that Nicole probably did that because she just thought that their marriage was like, quote, lacking. And then a fucking Stabler says, lacking? Interesting choice in words. What is it you were lacking, dick? <laughs> Stabler's like, I'm not really following what's going on here, but I know that I'm going to be able to call him a dick at some point. No, he was like talking about the size of his dick. I know. Oh, okay. So it was very clever. Yeah. Toots is like, you know, if I would have said that, nobody would have acknowledged like, it. Like, shut up, there's a baby involved. <laughs> so Richard calls him out. Oh, he's like, oh, yeah, challenging my masculinity. That's super amateur. And Wong's like, um, it's actually not amateur because challenging your masculinity is an obvious weakness. And then Richard's smile totally fades. Yeah, because Huang just did the same kind of read on Richard that Stabler did, except it was the smart guy version. Mm-hmm. So he was like, oh, shit. Mm-hmm. So Stabes then all sassy says to Richard, you're a smart guy. Your problem is you think you're smarter than everybody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh. Tiny butthole mouth. Tiny butthole mouth. <laughs> um Benson's like been to the gym lately and he's like oh yeah I totally forgot to mention that to you guys then the night of Nicole's attack I went to the gym I was like weird because you're supposed to be meeting your wife that's so weird so they start dogging on him for not being smart Benson says Nicole made him look stupid and he made her pay for it Stabler's like you almost killed your wife Huang says no he didn't he killed the fetus he just wasn't smart enough to do the job right Nicole will never have children and neither will you and Richard's like all I care about is my wife and family and it ruined everything and huang says your wife's child and so you got rid of it and then richard says wouldn't anyone so because of how disturbing this conversation was i was completely checked out and i was like this is where i'm starting to become very attracted to uh huang Mm -hmm. his unwavering eye contact because i was not applying it to the actual situation was really doing something for me right (laughs) So now we're in Cragen's office. Cabot and Cragen are on the other side of the glass in Cragen's bell tower. Cabot wants him. (laughs) (laughs) So Cabot wants him arrested for attempted murder, assault one plus abortion one. And Stabler's like, and murder. And Cabot's like, well, 
they have to establish that the fetus is legally a person at this point. And so at this point, now I'm like, now I understand why there's 14 minutes left in the episode. It's going to mm-hmm. get fucking weird. Legalese. Legal, legal abortion, fucking blah, blah, blah. So they have to find a way to find out if the fetus was alive, took a breath, moved, etc. If it died in the womb, it's technically not a person. The doctor said in the beginning that the fetus was viable outside of the womb. Benson says that if it had been born in the hospital, it would have lived. And Cabot says that it doesn't matter. And neonaticides are notoriously hard to prosecute because the medical evidence is always inconclusive. Without a witness, they don't really have anything. And the best they can do is an illegal third trimester abortion. Stabler's having a super rough time, obviously. Yeah. And he says, at seven months, a baby moves inside of its mother. The only reason why the baby is dead is because Richard bashed in its skull. Now, I don't care if you call it a person or not, that's murder. And Cabot says, that argument could also be used to condemn legal abortion. Do you want me to charge every doctor who performs abortion with murder? Here we fucking go. Here we fucking go. So Stabler mm-hmm. says, abortion is different. It's the mother's choice. And Cabot Which says- Which is not what I expected to come out of his I mouth in the year 2001. Same. Me neither. I was not expecting that. Cabot says, we're not talking about the mother's rights. You want to charge for homicide with the fetus as the victim. That's giving the fetus rights. Do you want to go down that road? And Stabler says it's not the same thing, but in the eyes of the law, it is. Mm -hmm. And so Stabler's like, the law needs to change. And Benson's like, I don't know, Elliot. You can't have it both ways. A fetus is either a life or it's not. And Stabler's mad and he points at Olivia and he says, Olivia, you saw that baby and this guy's going to walk. And Olivia says, I don't like it any more than you do but this is very dangerous territory. And Cabot's like, I'm not prepared to dismantle reproductive rights on an inconclusive case. Or in general, please. Stabler does that thing where he gets like slowly louder as the sentence goes on. And he's like, we're going to let a murderer go to preserve a political ideal. I don't even know what I'm fucking doing here. And Kraken's like, take a break, detective. Go fucking toss some cups or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Cabot tells Benson that if the ME finds solid evidence the fetus was born alive, then they have something to work with. She won't charge murder for an unborn child. She can't by law, remember? Like, Mm -hmm. she's not doing this. Cabot isn't doing this. Right. She's not making this up as she goes. Yeah. If she can't prosecute something, it's not because she doesn't like you, Stabler. It's the law. You know what I mean? Like, but then you're fucking licking her butthole when when they win a case. Like, let her do her fucking job. Oh, whatever. Yeah. Eat her ass either way. <laughs> it's 2017. <laughs> Everyone's eating ass. <laughs> what is that from? That was just my friend in 2017. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's 2017. Everybody's eating ass. And I was like, fuck. All right. I, I assumed it was from something because you quoted a year. <laughs> it's just my friend in 2017. <laughs> Craigan tells Benson and Sailor to get down to Coroner Warner's office and stay there till she hands him the autopsy. He wants Cabot there to make sure the evidence they find is solid. Emmy office. Coroner Warner is rambling off medical terminology while Cabot is watching a different Emmy perform an autopsy, like weighing a liver or something. Coroner Warner said that the baby took a breath. It was a live birth. If they're going to charge Richard with the murder of the baby, they have to drop the abortion charge and the attempted murder of Nicole. Cabot says that they can only have one theory of the crime. Either he was trying to kill Nicole or the baby, and I don't understand why they can't fucking... I don't understand that either. It's like, why can't he... You can't be trying to kill two people? Yeah. So Coroner Warner has to testify and be able to give rock solid evidence or Richard literally could just walk away from all of this with no charges except maybe assault. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then he would get like maybe two years or something. But it's fucking Coroner Warner and she's damn sure. That's right. All right. Now we're at trial and Coroner Warner is on the stand being examined by Richard's lawyer. She's telling him that she performed a hydrostatic test, which is putting the lungs in water. And if a large portion floats, it means the lungs had been inflated. The lawyer asked Coroner Warner if she would define postmortem putrefaction for him. This guy's being such a douche, too. I know. He's, he's like, like, I don't really get it. Um, it's like, you're I'm just a lawyer. Could you explain that like a scientist way to me? Yeah. He was like, you're looking at a guy who failed biology twice and then like looked over at the jury and smiled and you're like yeah okay it's like we're all dummies here right guys <laughs> Corner Warner says it describes the series of changes that happen to tissue after death so the lawyer's like oh some of those changes could possibly include gases which could be the cause of the lungs to float did you deflate the lungs of any gases after the first test and then reinflated them and she's like well actually performing the test twice is misleading and he's like well i'm really here trying to make it look like you don't know how to do your job Mm -hmm. even though i just said that i don't know shit he's like oh maybe you were busy or something and cabot's like objection you know (laughs) 
Yeah. Cabot of Jackson says, hey, there's probably a bunch of tests that she didn't perform because they weren't relevant. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the judge is like, mm, Elva ruled. So Coroner Warner says that she didn't perform the test a second time. The lawyer asks her if it's possible the expansion of the lungs could be because of the postmortem putrefaction gases. And she's like, yeah, it's possible, but there are other factors. No. The lawyer cuts her off mm -hmm. because that's what they do, because they want to paint a picture, because the law is fucking weird and the judicial system is fucking weird. Mm -hmm. And he's like, let's assume that you were correct and the fetus took a breath. A fetus is considered born if it is completely expelled from the uterus. Is it possible it took a breath partially expelled, but died before it was fully expelled? I was like, this guy is fucking really good at like casting doubt. Like, holy shit. This guy is splitting the finest of hairs. I know. It is what needs to be done in this kind of case. And it's like really great lawyering, mm. but it's really irritating factually. Right. So Corner Warner's like, well, I mean, yeah, that's a possibility. But the oxygen that the baby would have taken a breath of would have been outside of the body. So why is like where the baby technically is? I don't know. I mean, it does matter, but it's ugh. she's like, yeah, there's no way to know when the breath was taken short of eyewitness testimony. So now like Cabot has to get Richard on the stand and get him like riled up and get him to talk about the baby. <laughs> she's got to do some trickery. If anybody can do it, she can. Now we're in the courthouse hallway. Stabler's like angry pacing back and forth. Mm -hmm. And he's taken all his shit out on Cabot. Of course. He's saying she let the lawyer sandbag Corner Warner. And Cabot's like, oh my God, dude, the lawyer wasn't wrong. There's no way to prove when the baby took a breath. She's like, every time you ask me to do something and it doesn't work out, you're like, why didn't that work out? Mm -hmm. She goes, if you want to blame me for that too, go ahead. I don't have time for your tantrum. Mm -hmm. So the husband, John Ritter... Richard has Dick. to either outright confess or he'll be out in two fucking years. And she's like, I wish I could do more. And I'm like, ooh, they need a confession, you say? Mm. I wonder what's going to happen. <laughs> okay, so now we're in the court jail area, whatever the fuck. Stabler walks up to the cell thing that Richard and his lawyer are in. And Richard turns around and says, detective, what a surprise. Like, all smug. Uh, One of my favorite things that he says in this conversation, John Ritter Richard turns his back, but he's facing camera. And he's like, huh, you're lucky, detective. Usually my time costs $200 an hour. Mm. <laughs> And he's got this creepy smile. He looks so terrifying. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, yeah. oh, I'm afraid of you. Good job. <laughs> Richard asks his lawyer to leave him and Stabler alone. Like, what a cocky fuck. He goes, Trevor, leave us alone. Also, his lawyer's hot. Oh, I wasn't even looking at his lawyer at this point. I was watching that sweet, sweet John Ritter acting mm -hmm. class. <laughs> Stabler's like, you must be pretty proud of yourself. Getting everyone to believe your story. And Richard's like, well, it's the truth. Stabler's just straight out asked Richard to tell him how he murdered the baby. And Richard's like, please, bitch. You actually think you're going to get me to confess something? But that's not why you're really here, is it? And Stabler's like, you're going to shrink me now? Dude is basically like, yeah, have a seat. So fucking Stabler does. And Richard asks him if Stabler would do anything to protect his family. Stabler says, mm, killing a child. No, I don't see myself doing that. And Richard says, you understand that impulse and you know exactly why I did what I had to do. And Oof. Stabler says, protect what you have by destroying it. And Richard says... Uh, Richard's like, I didn't destroy anything. So Stabler gets up slowly and leans in and says, think about it. And starts to leave when Richard is like, I didn't destroy anything. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, Stabler got in his head a little bit. He planted a little doubt seed. Which took almost nothing. I know. So the fact that you're like, I'm so smart. I'm really smart. I'm super smart. And Stabler's like, are, are you? you? And he's like, what? It took <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yeah, but are you? <gasps> Boom. <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah, I am. I killed him. I'm a him. smart boy. <laughs> yeah, I'm a smart boy. <laughs> okay, so now we're in trial again. Richard is on the stand telling his side of the fucking story. He's bullshit. He was mm. waiting at the restaurant for her, and all he could think about was that she was with him, and they were laughing at him, and he says... Like she was with Kyle. Kyle, yeah. He says, as a psychiatrist, I was having a, quote, total textbook break with reality, and Cabot's having a hard time getting her eyes back from rolling them so hard. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Like, just blatant eye rolling. He says that, like, all of a sudden, he's running through the park, acting in all these irrational emotions, munching to to walk into the courtroom and hand Cabot a file all the while Richard is still talking about his irrational 
fucking blah, blah, blah. And he can't believe he did that. Blah, blah, blah. He's so sorry. Blah, blah, blah. And poor Nicole's there sitting in the gallery with Kyle and her eyes are welling up while he's up there just coldly being, he's telling this with zero emotion. Like you know, he's, he's just like, oh, well, here's the explanation for why I did it. I was not in my right mind. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Shrug, shrug, shrug. I'm I feel sorry. like, too, it's almost like he's thinking that they're going to be together and everything's fine because there's no yeah. baby. It's like fucking weird. Now it's Cabot's turn. At this point, I'm so excited to see what she's going to do. Mm-hmm. Cabot comes up to the judge and says she's got some evidence. And Richard's lawyer is like, we have no knowledge of the evidence. <laughs> like, he like, freaks out. <laughs> and the judge goes, knock it off. And she's like, you guys both get up here. <laughs> The judge reads the file and hands it to Richard's lawyer. The lawyer says uh, it can't be used because it wasn't presented to them in discovery. And then Cabot's like, yeah, but this doesn't relate to the charge. So there was no duty to give it in discovery. So the judge lets it in. And I'm like, what is it? And I'm surprised once we find out what it is. I'm surprised because I'm like, okay, well, if it doesn't relate to the charge. Why would she let it in? I feel like most judges at least like in the stuff that we've read, like the real life stuff, they'd be like, then it doesn't apply. There's no reason to have it in. Yeah. Even if it feels like it really should be in and it really matters. Sometimes I feel like the judges are just like, the story is so good. I just want to hear. That's what it sounded like. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. She's like, oh my God. Yeah. Let it in. Oh my God. I got, (laughs) I got to see how the judge turns into RuPaul with tiny glasses. (laughs) I can't wait to see how this turns out. (laughs) Cabot sums up what Richard claimed his story is, the irrational emotions and psychotic break that made him attack Nicole and cuddle the fetus. And then was like, is this correct? And he's like, yeah. And Cabot says, how did you know she was telling the truth about being pregnant and it being Kyle's? Were you unable to have children? And were you having sex with your wife seven months prior to their attack? And he's like, "Uh, (laughs) I'm capable of having children. And he's like, yeah, and we were having sex. Like, we're married. He says he knew about the affair before she even told him. He said he knew almost from the beginning. Cabot asked him if it's at all possible Nicole was having an affair with someone that he didn't know about, like another guy. Like a whole other dude. A whole other dude, yeah. And Richard says, absolutely not. And Cabot's like, well, how do you... Pork in a completely different wiener. This is a whole different pork a thon (laughs) pork a thon (laughs) Cabot says that the only two people who could have possibly fathered that child would be either him or Kyle. And then Richard's like, she told me it was him. And fucking Cabot pulls out the evidence Munch and Toots gave her. It's the paternity test for the baby. And I totally forgot about the paternity test. And then... The envelope pops open and D.A. Stan Villani, who looks like Maury Povich, pops out. (laughs) So Kyle is not the father. So that means Richard is. Mm -hmm. Cabot says, isn't it probable that you were the father of your wife's child? So he's freaking out. He's like, I would have known, you know, because he's so smart. I would have known. She asked, how could you have known? She's got him right where she wants him. And then she asks him, did your son cry before you killed him? (gasps) And Richard shakes his head and says, He only cried a little. And I was like, oh, my fucking God. I cannot believe, because this is a fictional show for television, Mm -hmm. I cannot believe that his lawyer didn't object at any point here. I know. I was like, why is it so quiet in here? There's no effing way that this would have been, this line of questioning would have been allowed. You'd be like, objection, relevance, relevance, objection, relevance. (laughs) Like anything, you know? Objection, badgering the witness. Objection, Cabot. Please get to your point before I get irritated. <laughs> so that's the that's the fucking episode. So that's the end. That's the end of the episode. The episode's over. Let's do the chaser now. The chaser is awful. Let's talk about it. Um, okay. So this is going to be it's going to be a lot more legalese. So we're just going to try to head it on up to Omeletteville and like get through it. So on March 1st, 1991, Maria Flores was cashing her welfare check at a check cashing place in San Diego. With her was her 20-month-old son, Hector. She was also six months pregnant. As she left with $378 in cash, Robert Davis ran up on her, held her at gunpoint, and demanded her money. It was all Maria had, so she refused. Davis then grabbed her purse, shot her in the chest at close range, 
and left her to die. Life-saving surgery was then performed and Maria miraculously survived. Sadly, the next day, she had a stillbirth. It was the result of blood loss, low blood pressure, and shock. The connection here is that when Davis was caught, because criminals are stupid, he was charged with assault with a firearm, robbery, and murder of a fetus during the course of a robbery. Okay. Penal code 187 in 1994. Penal. Fuck you. (laughs) In 1994, California, quote, murder is the unlawful killing of a human being or a fetus with malice aforethought, which Mm. is like you intended to do it. This statute exempts abortion. The debate here for Davis was that Miss Flores' unborn child was considered a viable human person at the time of his death. This gets sticky because people attach the definition of human person to have a different value than what the cut and dry law is using it as Mm -hmm. far as definition. We attach an emotional value, which muddies things. Mm -hmm. Case in point, when the pregnancy is wanted and being cared for in preparation for an addition to the family, it's hard for me to just call the fetus a fetus, even though by definition that is what it is. Right, because, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, there's, like, baby showers and... The intention of the mother, I would argue, matters, but that creates more of a muddy situation there. Anyway, so the definition of a fetus is an unborn offspring of a mammal, in particular an unborn human baby, more than eight weeks after conception. Prior to that, a fetus is considered an embryo, so when does a fetus become a baby? Simply put at birth. Now there are all of these nutty biological events that happen super rapidly as that transition occurs. Mm -hmm. Surges of hormones, enormous changes in the cardiovascular and respiratory systems, etc. So technically, as we saw in Coroner Warner's testimony, there are scientific tests that can be done to determine this, which makes that seem very cut and dry. But... This case technically has nothing to do with a person's right to choose, Mm -hmm. but it all comes back to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it was argued that Davis did not know that Maria was pregnant and that mattered. It was literally said in documentation that Maria was quote short and heavy set. I mean, I know that it was meant to argue Davis's ability to tell that she was pregnant, but a lot of people with uteruses don't show very much at six months. Yeah. You know, I, I just look chubby at six months, but anyway, six weeks, you mean? No, months. Months? Months. Oh. She was between 23 and 25 weeks, which is just about six months pregnant. Oh, okay. Which can be viable, but viability was the real argument here. Okay? I feel with with Darla, you showed a lot faster than you did with Jacoby. Oh, fuck yeah, I did. Yeah. But that's because my body was like, oh, we know what's going on. Yeah. Fortunately for us... We have this new Elite Squad patron. She literally has been an Elite Squad patron for one day and responded to the questionnaire thing that we gave. So part of what she said was, uh, I'm a defense attorney and always happy to try and answer how things usually look in real life court. I'm like, bitch. (laughs) Hi. (laughs) Guess who's our new best friend? Mallory. 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 Isn't that a song? That's Valerie, but we can use it. (laughs) Mallory. The argument was brought up if he didn't know she was pregnant. Like, does that make a difference with his intention to kill the baby? Mm -hmm. All right. So I said to Mallory, OMG, do you mind if I use you as a resource right now? We're recording episode 11 today, and I'm trying to sift through some of the technical shit regarding penal codes. What would the appropriate charge be for someone that unintentionally killed someone? As in the case of like a drive-by shooting, which was the only thing I could come up with that would relate. They intended on killing someone else, but then a stray bullet killed a bystander. Is that manslaughter? Is there an unintentional homicide charge? She says... So if your intention was originally to kill and or harm someone, but you accidentally kill slash harm a completely different person, you are still responsible for the original intent under transferred intent. In the drive-by shooting scenario, if you meant to kill gang member X, but accidentally kill little Susie, you can still be found guilty of straight up premeditated murder. Hmm. That answers the whole question of... I meant to kill this person, but then I killed this person and it's still being murder charge. That does not apply to the fetus baby argument, but we're going to get back into that. Here we go. This is where they start peeling words apart, okay? Where they split fucking hairs because they have to. And I think this episode is a super good example of the legal system not being so black and white and how technical shit has to get for the law to be fair. Mm -hmm. We forget that it's like, yeah, this is a bad, 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 
bad thing, but we also have to lean into like the fairness of the law, right? which is really fucking hard when there's a lot of feelings come up when it regards fucking kids and pregnancy and babies and any controversial subject. Mm -hmm. So back to it, we're back in 1994. Obviously this case caused everyone to fucking flip on both sides of the abortion argument. Mm -hmm. It was speculated that they were going to overturn Roe v. Wade, which is like, aren't we all freaking out about that? Like every five years. Mm -hmm. So they had to define whether this fetus is a human or not in the most scientific way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Back to the, like leaving all of the feelings of like, of course it's a human life, whatever, leaving that out of it. We're talking about technical terminology. Mm -hmm. The jury's task in the murder conviction was twofold. They first had to determine viability of the fetus based on definition and then based on that finding would determine the murder conviction Mm -hmm. okay so this california court's definition of viable human life was this at the time quote a viable human fetus is one who has attained such form and development of organs as to be normally capable of living outside the uterus instead the jury was given this as a viability definition which was based on previous court of appeal decisions quote a fetus is viable when it has achieved the capability for independent existence that is when it is possible for it to survive the trauma of birth, although with artificial medical aid. All of this said, the California Supreme Court ruled six to one that a person who kills a fetus that is at seven weeks gestation can face murder charges with the possibility of the death penalty. Again, abortion is not a part of that. Yeah. Davis was sentenced to life without parole plus five years for murder and robbery and all that. He had all these other charges too, but the big one was the murder charge. Davis then appealed the decision with the argument that the court gave the wrong viability instructions to the jury. Mm. He cited U.S. Supreme Court decisions in abortion cases set forth by Roe v. Wade, quote, The point in fetal development when a fetus, if born, would be capable of living normally outside the womb. And I feel like all this could have been avoided if they would have kicked it off, right? But again, the debate is like so muddy because they shouldn't have even brought this other description of viability Mm -hmm. if that wasn't the one that was like currently being used. So the appellate court ended up ruling against Davis, going back to the basics of the 187 Penal Code statute, fetal viability is not a required element of a murder charge or conviction, okay? Mm -hmm. So in the 187 Penal Code, it says that if you kill a fetus, which is from, what is it, 10 weeks to birth, Mm -hmm. or like seven, I think they have it at seven weeks to birth, that's fetal homicide. But even though they were like, no, we're ruling against you, the court still reversed the murder conviction Hmm. because they then applied the new interpretation that to maintain the murder conviction would, quote, violate both the due process and the ex post facto clauses of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the new interpretation from Roe v. Wade, which is the standard, which is what we go by, would impinge on his constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. So due process is the Fifth Amendment basically stating fairness, Mm-hmm. like a fair trial yeah. and ex post facto would be punishing Davis retroactively. Like because that definition that they originally brought in was no longer applicable, they couldn't use it in charging him with murder. Okay. The only reason they were able to reverse that charge is because of the wrong thing. Yeah. Is because of the constitutional rights, not because it wasn't technically fetal murder. Hmm. It's all very confusing. Yeah. Are you confused? Mm-hmm. I'm going to read you what Mallory wrote. I said, I'd love to quote someone who actually understands the law and isn't just some bitch with Google and a microphone. (laughs) That's me. (laughs) So Mallory says this. Oh, I'm sorry. She just responded. She said, if you reference me, you can just call me Mal. Sorry, Mal. But now we have a song for you. So So she says, People v. Davis ruled that it can be considered murder if someone's actions expires a seven to eight week fetus. I think that's nuts. But other states use the quote, born alive rule or, quote, viability. I think I would side more on the, quote, born alive rule where you can be convicted of murder if the child has been born alive, Mm -hmm. like in the episode. Yeah. Obviously, this is such a controversial topic via pro-choice, anti-abortionist, etc. How do we know when an in utero child is human? 
That's an almost impossible thing to determine. Is it when we can determine when the fetus feels pain? How do we know when the fetus develops a conscience? In 2004, the U.S. enacted the Unborn Victims of Violence Act, the UVVA, which made it so all persons except the mother could be held liable for the death or bodily injury of an in utero child. But then, using Davis as an example, what if the mother intentionally stabbed her own stomach at six and a half months pregnant to kill the in utero child? She wouldn't be held responsible while Davis would, that doesn't seem fair and just. But then what if a six and a half month pregnant woman attempts suicide, but she survives and the fetus does not? Should she be charged with murder? This would be considered transferred intent as well. Under the UVVA, she wouldn't be, but it just shows another example of why it can get so murky. Mm -hmm. Also, the UVVA feels like the federal government deceptively making anti-choice legislation to further humanize fetuses and create rights for the fetus to further the agenda of anti-abortion. That's just a mal aside um, that I agree with. Violence against women is fucking terrible and against pregnant women is atrocious, but the sad truth is tougher laws do not deter crime. Harsher punishments do not make criminals think twice before they do something. The only deterrent to crime is more resources in addiction recovery, mental illness treatment, Mm -hmm. and poverty relief. Going back to Davis, my personal feelings is he should have been charged with attempted murder plus robbery, assault, etc., but not murder. I could spend hours and write dozens of pages on this, of course, but those are just snippets of my thoughts. She said, I found this really interesting article about fetal homicide. It's like 60 pages. It may only be interesting to me because I'm a nerd, but I thought I would share it. So I'm going to put this in the show notes because it is super interesting, but it is, get one of your smart friends to read it because I'm like, or maybe you're the smart friend. I don't know. It's extremely interesting. It's extremely controversial. It's heartbreaking on every front and everybody has a fucking strong opinion about it. Yeah. But even though I have like a super strong opinion about it, I still feel wobbly. Like when they're talking about, is it a fetus? Is it a baby? And then it's like, well, she wanted it. So to me, it's a baby. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, and if it's like, okay, it's a, the a, the person's right to choose. Isn't that a part of what someone should be charged with? Like, shouldn't that person with the uterus, with the baby in it, have a say? You know what I mean? Like, what do you think? I don't think that somebody's feelings should be like, this is how you should be charged then, because that is a slippery slope. I know, but intent plays a part of so many other crimes. But. And charges. I know, but you're, I would just go by what the, the law defines it as, because that's too, that to me is too much. Go I'm talking about using that to apply to the law or like applying that to the law. But I don't know. I just don't. It's just bonkers that this woman was shot in the chest. Don't forget, her, she was holding her fucking toddler, was shot in the chest, dropped him on the ground, and then was miraculously saved and, and lost her baby that she, for all we know, was carrying to term to be a mom to and raise and whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all so fucked. I know. But then also I agree with Mal because of course he should be charged with attempted murder. Mm -hmm. But I feel like there should be some charge for like the level of loss that she, Mm -hmm. her level of loss was greater than someone who wasn't carrying a baby in the same exact situation. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just, uh, it's fucked. Let's stop talking about this. (laughs) Cool. That's what I want. (laughs) Great. Next week. Season 3, Episode 12, Protection. A boy who is six years old is shot and then abandoned in the emergency room by his scared mom, sending detectives in search of his missing family in the gunman. Cool. More kid stuff. Cool. Awesome. This is fun. It is fun. This is fun. It is fun. So not so much. You know? Not so much. it's It's a show. It's a show, and some of it gets a little dicey, but that's all right. We are... I'm just going to insert like 10 minutes of farts at the end of this episode. (laughs) Whenever anybody asks about the pod, I'm like, yeah, it's super fucking lowbrow though. So don't listen to it. (laughs) So I'm just like, oh, how do I make this episode funny? Farts probably. (laughs) Thank you so much to our Elite Squad patrons. Haley K, Sonia W, Jenny S, Sky K, Nikki B, Marissa M, Elky H, Sarah A, Annie G, Mary D, Andrew, Rebecca D, Miranda B, Shelby W, Lex, Emily T, Kayla W, Mallory G, Mal, and Eliza W. You guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. One, two, three. Thank Thank you you so so much. (laughs) 
We appreciate you. Thank you so much for your support. You guys are amazing. If you want to become a patron, go check us out. Patreon.com slash SVU pod. We got a bunch of stuff over there. Yeah. You want us to yell your name at the end of an episode? You want to hear your name at the end of an episode? <laughs> you go, you just go on and you just go on and you give us a little stop, bit of something. Stop it. <laughs> you just want your name in the show notes. You just want to have your name in the show notes. Stop. I don't That's like this. Tier. That's I hate it. Tier. We got garbage cookies, friendship boats. We got mugs. We got, I don't like this. We got discounts on merch. We got exclusive pulls. There's all kinds of stuff going on over there. Sweater weather. Sweater okay. weather. <laughs> also, yeah. follow us on our social media at SVU Pod. Email us at svupod at gmail.com. Website www.svupod.com. We got merch on there. Join our Facebook group. Um, I fucking love that group. It's so fun. Everybody's so fucking hilarious. Gabe's in there so hard. I am. <laughs> Like somebody will post something and Gabe's like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it so much. It's so fucking fun. Everybody's cool. Yeah. SVU Pod Elite Squad is our Facebook group. So go join that. I have to change the like the entry questions because one of them is about big cat nudes. And there's been people that are like, I don't remember. That was season one. I so I think I might change a few things but i do just have it be like, like do you want to be friends with us <laughs> will you be our no. friend no <laughs> no because then you get randos you get randos that are like they're not even listeners they're not even a part of us oh no i mean one of the questions it's like do you want to be my friend <laughs> like it's i it's more way more pathetic sounding than what you were thinking. it is <laughs> <laughs> i didn't want to say that like that is sad that is- <laughs> 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 okay guys uh okay guys that's it you stop it tasha all right love you bye love you bye <laughs>